Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hello, everyone. Now, before we start our introductions, let's first of all make sure that everyone is aware of the simultaneous translation options we have available for you today. On your Zoom menu, you will see a button called Interpretation. Now, the slides and the original audio will be in English, but you can also listen to simultaneous translation in Arabic, French, Russian, Spanish, and Mandarin Chinese. I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar where we're going to talk all about the doping control process. My name is Mary Irvin, and I am a member of the education team at the International Testing Agency. This is the second in a series of five webinars we are bringing to you every Thursday in conjunction with your sport federation. A big welcome back to those of you who joined last week and welcome to any of you joining us for the first time today. And it goes without saying, please do say hi to us in the chat. I will try and do as many shout outs as I can. Uh, I would like to say a big hello to everyone in Baku and other parts of Azerbaijan. I saw you joined in uh, large numbers last week and lots of you are already saying hi to us today as well. I can also see people joining us from Argentina, from Colombia, from Venezuela, from Norway. Uh, a big welcome to you all. Now, just like last week, we are going to be doing some poll questions throughout the session to make it nice and interactive. So please do join in. We will also have the Q&A option available to all of you at any time. So please do take this opportunity to ask us anything related to doping control. You can also upvote a question. So even if you don't have a question yourself, you can push the ones that you'd like answered to the top. And we'll tackle as many as we can at the end of the session. And one final point that this session is being recorded. Okay, let's take a look at who is joining us. We have the same federations as last week, all seven of you. So a big, big welcome to you all from the sports of luge, gymnastics, judo, roller sports and skateboarding, golf, boxing and baseball and softball. Now, this is the second of a five week course we are delivering for you. Over the course of this series, we will cover all the compulsory education topics as set out in the World Anti-Doping Code. We're going to help you keep on top of your anti-doping responsibilities. And as with last week, each week, we will always tell you the learning objectives and the agenda and leave you with a list of resources where you can read extra information. We'll also send you the presentation as a PDF so at the end of the five weeks, you have a full overview of the subject. Now, we also know how popular certificates are and we're delighted to offer a certificate to all of you who participate in all five sessions. So on that note, please do register with the same email address so we can keep a proper track of attendance. Okay, so let's take a look at today's agenda. Firstly, we're going to take a look at what the doping control process is and what the key roles and terms you need to be familiar with are. We will then take a step-by-step -step look at the doping control process, including the athlete notification process, doping control rights and responsibilities, and also valid reasons for requesting a delay. We will then talk about the urine sample collection process. Next up, we want to run through some common scenarios, such as what happens if you can't provide enough urine or what happens if it's too diluted. We will then take a look at the second method of sample collection, blood. Then we're going to show you what the doping control form looks like and give you some tips to fill it in. We will then look at something called ABP. I will not tell you what this means as this is one of our poll questions later on. So you can already get thinking about this now, if you like. Then 
At the end of the session, I will invite my colleague and doping control expert, Richard Mann, to join me to answer your questions live. So on that note, please do remember to drop your doping control questions into the Q&A box. Now, if you have a lot of experience with doping control, or if you are an athlete who has been tested in the past, we hope that today's session will be a good refresher. And if you are new to the anti-doping system and have not yet been tested, this is a good introduction to the process. So having said all that, let's take a look at today's learning objectives. So by the end of today's session, we would like you to understand the key terms and roles in the doping control process, know the key steps of doping control, have good knowledge of athlete rights and responsibilities with respect to doping control, know what happens in both urine and blood sample collection, the role of the athlete in both of these processes, and how to complete the doping control form. And finally, to be aware of some common things, such as providing a partial sample or reasons why you can ask for a delay to testing. More about all of this a little bit later. Okay, so let's get us all thinking about a very important liquid in the doping control process. Yes, that's right, P. So to start with, let's start with a fun poll question all about P. Now, appearing on your screens now, there will be a poll question, the first one of the day, which I am going to read out to all of you now. And it is simply, which of the following taglines has the ITA used in education campaigns? And you can vote for what, as many of these as you like. It's born to pee wild. To pee or not to pee, it's not a question. Train, eat, sleep, compete, pee, repeat. Is it none of the above or is it all of the above? So please do cast your votes. Whilst you're having a think about that, I'm going to have a look in the chat because for some reason I am not seeing the answers coming through to the poll question here. So maybe you could also think about the answer and write the answer in the chat too. Okay, so I'm going to give you few more seconds to think about the answers. Okay, and let's close up this poll now. And as I mentioned, this is just a fun one to start off with. I can now see the responses, so that is fantastic. I see that the most popular choice there was train, eat, sleep, Compete, P, repeat, with 44% of you choosing that one. That is indeed one of the correct answers, but in fact, we have indeed used all of these taglines to try and make anti-doping education as fun as possible. And here, just very quickly, I will show you an example of these taglines being used in our stickers that we often give out at events. Okay, so whilst the taglines are fun, it is very important as an athlete or athlete support personnel to understand what doping control is and some keywords surrounding it. So on your screen now, you will see the definition of doping control from the World Anti-Doping Code. You can see how much it involves from planning testing all the way through to the appeals process following a positive test. Now, in this session, we're going to focus on sample collection. And it's important to remember that there are two types of testing, in competition and out of competition. And we have a whole session dedicated to out of competition testing on the 28th of July. Also, 
athlete testing is carried out in accordance with the world anti-doping code and the international standard for testing. You will remember that we talked briefly about the international standard for testing last week when we looked at the anti-doping landscape. There are also a number of key roles associated with doping control that you should be familiar with, and they will appear on your screens in just a moment. This is an official who has been trained and authorised to collect a urine sample from an athlete. Then we have a blood collection officer or BCO. And this is someone qualified and authorised to collect a blood sample from an athlete. Next up, we have a chaperone. Now, a chaperone is an official who is trained and authorised to carry out specific duties, such as notification of the athlete, accompanying and observing the athlete, and witnessing and verifying the provision of the sample. Now, there are also a couple of terms to be familiar with. Firstly, the doping control form is the form athletes complete during the doping control process. And this is a very important document that we will discuss in detail a little bit later on. And the last term on your screen is the doping control station, which is simply the location where the sample collection is carried out. OK, let's try another poll question now, a bit more serious this time, to see if you are already aware of the steps of the doping control process. So on your screens, you can see today's second poll question. These are the steps in the testing process that are the most important for athletes to be aware of. So let's try and put them in the correct order. So the question is, what is the correct order of these key steps of the doping control process? And the options you can choose for this time, just one correct answer are option one, selection, notification, form completion, sample collection, or option two, selection, notification, sample collection, form completion, option three, notification, selection, sample collection, form completion, and then option four, notification, selection, form completion, and sample collection. Now, unfortunately today, I can't see your results coming in live. So I'm just going to take my best guess as to when to close the poll. I'm not going to do it quite yet. This question is a little bit trickier. So I'm going to give you all a little bit more time to answer. And I will just say a few more shout outs while you're all thinking of the response. So hello to you in St. Martin, Solomon Islands, San Lucia, more from uh, Azerbaijan, Colombia, Argentina. Uh, Lesotho, Qatar, Somalia, Zambia, Angola, welcome to all of you. Okay, I am going to take a guess that quite a number of you have had an attempt at this question. So let's close the poll up now and take a look. Okay, so let's see the correct answer. Now, 33% of you have chosen option one. You guys think that option one is the correct answer. The actual answer that is correct is option two. That is the athlete is selected, first of all, then the athlete is notified, then the athlete provides the sample, and then the form is filled in. So well done to those of you who got it correct. If you didn't, please don't worry, we're going to go through all of this in detail. So by the end of the session, you should know 
uh, all the headline information about the doping control process. Okay, so let's also see this visually and let's take a look at the steps of the doping control process that are appearing now in the correct order on your screen. And today we're going to be concentrating on the first five. And in parallel, we will also look at athlete rights and responsibilities when it comes to doping control. So now you have a bit of an oversight of the process, but what about who can test athletes? Well, NADOs, IFs and major event organisers can all test athletes, as can delegated third parties like us, the International Testing Agency. And who can be tested? Well, all athletes who operate under the jurisdiction of an anti-doping organisation and are subject to their anti-doping rules can be tested. As we saw earlier, we're going to start with athlete selection. Now, there are three main criteria for why an athlete could be selected for doping control. It can be performance based. So the top performing athletes, for example, the medalists. It can also be random. This means any athlete can be randomly selected for testing. For example, after a competition, it is not only highly ranked athletes that can be tested, but any athlete competing that day. It can also be targeted, for example, if there is a reason to test a particular athlete. It's important to understand that all athletes can be subject to testing. And as mentioned before, testing can take place at any time, not just during a competition. Okay, so once an athlete has been selected for doping control, the athlete is then notified about this. So let's now watch a short video to see how this notification process works. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name's Alana. I'm from the ITA, uh, nice the to International meet you. Testing Agency. Nice to meet you. Um, you've been identified today uh, for doping control. Um, can I just check your name, please? Yes, I'm Melody Moore. Yeah, great. So I'll just complete this. This is your notification form. So I'll just copy it off your yep. identification yep. there. Uh, and can I have your nationality? Trainer. Yep. And just noting down the date today. Uh, so on the form just down here, you've got your uh, athlete rights and responsibilities, and mm -hmm. it's really important that you know what those are. Yep. So please have a read through here. Um, I'll get you to just sign here to say that you've been notified. And just noting down the time of notification. Yep, correct. And I'll just get you to sign. Okay. Yep. Great. So the doping control is just down the hall. So I'll get you to come with me and then we'll complete the sample. Sure, let's go. Through here. Hello. Hello. Welcome to the doping control station. So I uh, hope can I just you check enjoyed your that please? video. Thank you. You heard the athlete being told it was important to understand Great. their rights. Any delays and today? No delays reporting today. Wonderful. Okay, apologies everyone. I seem to have lost connection briefly there. 
May I please ask uh, if you can write in the chat and if my team can send me a WhatsApp message to let me know if everything is now okay. Excellent, I'm seeing a thumbs up from someone there. And apologies as well for my lighting. Uh, hopefully the main thing is that you can still hear me. Okay, so let's uh, carry on from where we were. We were just finishing watching the athlete notification uh, video. And now we want to move on to looking at the athlete responsibilities and rights during doping control. So firstly, the responsibilities of the athletes are to report for testing immediately if selected, as the athlete did in the video, to show valid identification. This can be your passport or during a major games, an accreditation is accepted as identification. Then the athlete must remain in direct sight of the doping control officer or chaperone at all times. And of course, the athlete must comply with the blood sample collection procedure. The doping control or blood collection officer will instruct you step-by-step step during this process. Equally important is for athletes to know their rights during doping control. So athletes can have a representative with them this can be a coach, team manager, doctor, and so on. And if an athlete is a minor, i.e. under 18, then they should have a representative with them. Athletes can also request an interpreter to help with translation if needed. Athletes can also request special assistance or modifications to the process. For example, if an athlete is injured and needs a wheelchair. Athletes can also ask the DCO any questions about the process at any time. And athletes should request the identification of a chaperone or DCO. Athletes should also record any comments, positive or negative on the doping control form. These have absolutely no effect on the outcome of your test. And finally, athletes can request a delay for valid reasons. So let's now look at those valid reasons in a little bit more detail. And these things can include attending a victory ceremony, finishing a training session, receiving medical attention, fulfilling a pre-arranged media commitment or warming down after training or competition. Ultimately, it's the doping control officer that decides whether the request to delay testing is valid. So that's quite a close look at the notification process. Let's now test your understanding of some of the things we have talked about during this phase by doing our third poll question of the day. We've even included a couple of new scenarios in this poll to test your thinking even more. Okay, let's take a look at poll question number three. And once again, this is a multiple choice. You can choose the correct statements from the four below. So once more, please cho choose all that you think apply. So answer number one, an athlete can refuse to be tested if a doping control officer is unable to provide a valid identification. An athlete can request physical assistance if they are injured. An athlete can only request a delay during an in-competition doping control and an athlete can leave the doping control station unattended if the doping control officer allowed them to delay testing. Okay, so this is quite a detailed question here, but thank you all for beginning to vote. I can see your answers this time, so that is fantastic. I, 
I'm now very aware of how many of you have voted. So it's great to see that already we have 40% of you voting. I'm just going to pause for a few seconds to allow even more of you to vote, please. And whilst I pause, time for a few more shout outs, a few more countries here that I spotted. Greece, Portugal, Uzbekistan, Haiti, India, Peru, Brazil and Lebanon. Once again, welcome to all of you. OK, so well done. I can see 60% of you and more have voted. So let's close the poll down and take a look at the answers. And I thought this may well have been the trickiest one so far, but I am very pleased to say that the first two answers are the most popular and they are also the answers that are correct too. So answer number three is not correct. Delays can be granted for valid reasons in the out of competition testing too. And number four is not correct either, as an athlete can leave the doping control area if the DCO has agreed to delay testing, but, and this is the important part, they must be accompanied at all times. Okay. Just to cover another common question that we often get asked about doping control, and that is, what if I can't pee immediately? And the answer to that is, that is absolutely fine. The doping control officer will wait for you as long as needed. Okay, let's move now to step three, which is the sample collection process. So we're going to take a bit of a look at a video in a moment that includes the kit that we use for the urine sample collection. But first, a quick but important note to make sure that you all understand that the sample collection must be watched by the DCO or the chaperone. Now, how this is done depends on the circumstances. For urine sample collection from a male athlete, the doping control officer will stand to the side of the athlete. For urine sample collection from a female athlete, the doping control officer will stand in front of the athlete. And in urine sample collection with an accompanying person, the DCO watches the athlete and then the witness or accompanying person watches the DCO. It's really important that you understand this because we wouldn't want anyone to not have a representative during doping control because they had concerns that their coach or team manager or parents acting as a representative would see them peeing and not just peeing, but peeing into a cup, which we will see in just a few moments. OK. So now for the moment when the sample is actually collected. Now, we're obviously not going to show you a video of someone peeing, but we do want to show you what happens next once the urine sample has been collected. So let's take a look at this video now. Okay, so please place your sample on the table. Thank you. All right. So, good. So, can you just turn this slightly around so I see how many milliliters you have? So, 125. Perfect. Good. Select one of the boxes. So, check if it's not opened or damaged. If you're okay with it, then just open it like this. Take the foil off and then where the arrows are here. So up. Yes. Good. Take everything out. Okay, good. So the pink paper is instructions. You can throw it away. And this is what. Good. So the first, the most important part, check the numbers. So top, bottom, and the box. All the numbers need to match. Okay, so you can see there's a string 
on the side of the bottle. You can just pull it from top to bottom to open the top. Perfect. Do the same for this one. Great. Now remove the tops. Perfect. You can throw the red rings away as well. So all of this goes to the bin. Okay, so you have the A and the B bottle. We're going to start with the B one. So just make sure this is on correctly so it doesn't spill where you pour. Perfect. Remove the little plastic. So as you can see, there's a small line on the bottom. You need to go on the line. To help you out, I'll just say stop when I see you're close. Perfect. Stop. And then the rest goes in the A bottle. There's a maximum line on the white label. You also need to go on the line. I will say stop. A little bit more. Stop. Perfect. And then put the rest in the B and just leave a few drops in the end. That's perfect. Close them. So you put this on top and you start turning until you cannot turn it. Perfect. Same for this one. I'll just double check that the bottles are sealed properly. Check if it leaks. It's fine. Also fine. Perfect. So you can pack them in these plastic bags. So one for each. That's perfect. So once they're inside, you can pull this white tape and then stick it together. Oh. So it closes the plastic bag. Perfect. Same for this one. Wonderful. You can put both back in the box. Close the box. Right. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that video and I'm pleased to see that I'm back and a little bit clearer for you all to see now as well. Now, what I would like you to take away from this video is that I hope you noticed that it, it was the athlete that chooses and touches the equipment. That's really important to remember. And that the DCO simply double checks the seals at the end. Okay, let's move on now to something called partial sample, first of all. And I'm gonna go through a few more points in some detail not just about uh, partial samples, but also something called specific gravity. But first up, partial samples. Now, once the sample is provided, the DCO will check that the sample has the correct combination of volume and density to be able to be tested by the lab. Athletes have to provide at least 90 mils during a sample collection, Anything below that is considered a partial sample. Now, the urine in the A bottle is initially tested in the lab for nearly 200 prohibited substances. So there must be sufficient volume in the bottle to allow all these tests to be performed. 
the bee bottle must also have sufficient urine volume to allow a confirmation test to be performed if needed. In case of an adverse analytical finding, athletes have a right to have the bee sample analysed. And we mentioned this point last week when we talked about the Athletes Anti-Doping Rights Act. And for reference, this refers to right number 12. Now, doping control officers always test a urine sample's specific gravity. This is the measure used to determine whether a sample is concentrated enough to be tested in the lab. Now, generally, this can happen if an athlete has drunk too much liquid prior to testing and the sample is too diluted to be used. Then an athlete will be required to provide another sample and this will be the case until a suitable measurement is produced. And a quick note, you may think that having alcohol can help you pee quicker, but alcohol is not allowed in the doping control station. OK, let's take another quick look at a video, and this is going to show you briefly how the specific gravity measurement is performed. So I'll just get you to take the lid off the beaker. Okay. Okay, it's 1.15 over 5. Yep. Yes, I'll just get you to check. Yep, correct. Great. Right. Okay, so I'll just note that down. Okay, after all that information about urine collection, let's take a quick look at blood collection now. So, blood sample collection. This allows for the detection of additional substances that in some cases may not be detected in urine. You can see the steps and the equipment used on this slide. Firstly, there is the athlete notification and identification. This is the same process as for urine sample collection. Then we have the selection of the testing kit. Again, this is the same process as for urine sample collection. There should be at least three blood collection kits for an athlete to choose from, and the packaging must be intact. Once an athlete selects the kit, they check to make sure all the numbers match, as with the urine sample kit. Now with blood collection, the athlete must remain seated for 10 minutes before the sample is collected. This is important for stability before testing. So the athlete can be seated and selecting the kit and starting the paperwork during this 10 minute period. Then the BCO collects the blood sample. This is a maximum of 16 milliliters of blood which is less than two tablespoons. So this amount of blood should not affect an athlete's performance. The athlete seals the samples and places them in a secure container that will not be opened again until they arrive at the lab for testing. Then finally, the doping control form is filled in and signed. Again, this is the same process as for urine sample collection, and we'll take a look at this form next. So here you can see that we have reached step four of the process. Let's take a quick look at a video at how this works now. So no additional samples required. So we'll just cross out all other urine box. Great. So. Let's just check the number again. Okay. okay, so the next step is medication supplements for the last seven days. If you have any, please state them here. Okay. 
This is if you accept or not to put your sample into further anonymous research. So it's for laboratory research. You can either say yes or no. Um, it's totally independent of your testing for doping for this okay. sample. Okay, so I accept. Okay, do you have any comments in general about the procedure, about the Everything was okay. Okay, so let me just go back to the form. So you had no representative, so just cross out this box. Six. So, final time. Okay, check the form again. So we already did the notification part. Obviously the most important part is the number, so I'm going to ask you to check it again. Okay, your medication, supplements. Okay. So no comments as you said. And then just read this box here please. And one final signature here. Okay. Perfect. Let me just give you a copy of the form. Here you go. Thank you very much. Good Thank luck you. in your future competitions. Thank you very much. Okay, so as you saw in the video, the doping control form is a key document in the sample collection process. The form is a legal document that can be used in court if ever that is the case. It holds the athlete's personal information, the information used for lab analysis, information about the medications taken and therapeutic use exemptions and the athlete's signature. It also contains information about the notification process, any partial samples, if applicable, information about whether the athlete was accompanied or not, and any other comments. Therefore, it's essential that athletes double and triple check that everything on the form is correct. As once the form is signed, it becomes a confirmation by the athlete that everything on the form is accurate. This is also the reason why athletes are encouraged to check sample codes multiple times to make sure there are no mistakes. You will see some terminology on this form that talks about medications, supplements and therapeutic use exemptions. And we're going to talk about all of these things next week. Now, a couple of other important points about the form. The lab does not have access to the athlete name or nationality. It is the code that links the lab result to the athlete. You can write any observations about the process on the form. It's important to write on the form if you feel there was something amiss with the process, for example, as the feedback here will support that testing should be the same standard everywhere for every sport and every athlete. And if the form is paperless, meaning it is completed electronically on a tablet, you submit your comments prior to handing it back to the doping control officer. Okay, let's look at the next step in the process and that is the chain of custody. And essentially this is what happens to your sample next. Well, collected samples are packaged and sent to a WADA accredited uh, laboratory for analysis. The transportation is tracked and monitored by a chain of custody procedure to ensure its security. And blood samples are always placed in a cool box with a temperature logger. Now, we have talked a lot during this session about the role of the athlete, but athlete support personnel also play a key role in creating a supportive environment for the athlete and making the doping control process a positive experience. Athlete support personnel also have a right and a responsibility to write comments on the doping control form. Ultimately, however, as we talked about last week, 
the athlete is responsible, it is their sample being collected. Okay, so we are coming towards the end of our time together today. So let's launch a final poll on our last topic in this module. Now, the question is appearing on your screens now. And when I introduced the agenda earlier, I gave you a bit of a clue as to a poll question coming up. And this was where I did not spell out something in full. That is, what does ABP stand for? And you can choose one correct answer. Is it antibodies blood portal? Is it athlete biological passport? Is it analytical biomarker port? Or is it anti-doping biological passport? So thank you already. I can see more than 20% of you have cast your votes. Now these uh, questions are anonymous, so please don't be shy, give it a go even if you are not sure of the answer. I can see that we have two answers, answers two and four, that are neck and neck in the lead here. And I'd like to just try and get us to 60% before we close it up. So let's stop the poll here and take a look. Oh, and the correct answer, almost one there, but not quite. The most popular answer at 46% is the anti-doping biological passport. But in fact, the correct answer here is the athlete biological passport. And we just had a bit of fun making up some of the other answers. Okay, so the reason we are taking a quick look at the athlete biological passport during this session, is it so that you understand that it is not just individual sample collection that allows detection of doping practices. Let's take a little bit look at a slide that explains more about what the ABP is now. So the athlete biological passport has been around since 2009. They are individual electronic profiles that monitor selected athlete biological variables. And what does this mean? Well, ABPs contain athlete urine and blood sample results, which are tracked over time, and any significant variation from normal can be assessed for possible manipulation. Essentially, it monitors biological variables over time indirectly reveal the effects of doping. ABPs are integrated into ADAMS, the anti-doping administration and management system. Now I do know that was a very quick look at ABPs and if you are interested in learning more, we held a specific webinar on this topic in October last year and if you'd like to watch it, the links are in the resources section of these slides which you will receive shortly after the webinar ends. So what can we summarize from today? Well, if I was going to ask you to remember four things, it would be these. Know your responsibilities and follow them. Equally, know and exercise your rights in the doping control process and understand the situations where it's okay to ask for a delay. Follow the doping control process and the instructions of the DCO, BCO or chaperone. And remember, you are free to ask questions at any time. If you do not provide enough urine or the sample is too diluted, you will have to provide another sample. And you will have to repeat this process until there is enough volume and the concentration is adequate. Fill in the doping control form correctly and in full. Double check all the information, including your medications, supplements, and especially important, the sample codes for the lab. And as, as with last week, we are pleased to provide you with some additional resources on today's topic. On your screen is a picture of the ITA Real Sport Lab. This is a short guide for athletes about doping control. 
covering the rights and responsibilities we talked about today and the key points during sample collection. It is available in multiple languages, as you can see on your screens there for you to download. And next up, appearing on your screen now, are links to other useful resources for your future reading or viewing. Okay, so let's now move on to today's participant questions. And I'd like to, back, uh, to welcome my colleague, Richard Mann. He is the ITA's testing manager. And it's great to have you here with us, Richard. I can see we've already got a lot of questions coming through. So uh, thanks for listening into this session, first of all. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so let's take a look straight at the Q&A box. Uh, I'm not sure if you were able to monitor it uh, while you were listening in, Richard, but we'll tackle the questions uh, as much as we can in the order that they appear. And the first one here I have is from Sophia. And Sophia's question is, they would like to know, what is the difference between the control inside the competition, and sorry, the control outside the competition and the control within the competition. So I guess here they're, they're referring to the whole process. What's, what's different about it, if anything? No, again, that's a, it's a really good question. So I think, first of all, I guess, fundamentally within the token control process, um, there will be no differences in terms of going through that selection, notification, sample collection, and completing of forms. There may be a few different details when marking I guess on the forms in terms of the type of test that is either in competition, out of competition. Um, however, fundamentally, the token control process itself will remain the same. So I think it's really important to be aware though of the differences between in competition and out of competition based upon the definitions of the world anti-doping code. So essentially the in competition testing period for all athletes is 11 p.m. on the day before a competition which an athlete is due to be scheduled to compete in until the end of said competition. Uh, whereas out of competition is any period outside of that in competition period. And it's really important to be aware of that information due to the fact that different prohibited substances are, I guess, banned either at all times or only in competition. Thanks, Richard. And um, I'm glad you picked up on the, the out of competition uh, testing process there as well. And as I mentioned earlier as well, we do have a whole webinar dedicated to that in week five, where we will go through the out of competition period definition for each of your sports as well and make you aware of the various testing pools. So please do make sure you join us uh, in week five as well. Now, the next one, you could probably see me uh, looking down. I'm staring down at my phone here. Uh, the next one, I believe, is in Spanish. I'm not sure how your Spanish is, Richard, but I, I have had a member of the team translate it for me. And the question is, can an athlete decide not to take the test or is it compulsory to take the test once notified? So... An athlete, I guess, who is bound by uh, an international federation or national anti-doping organization's anti-doping rules, I guess, can be tested at any place or any time. I think that's really important to know because, I guess, uh, based upon the last answer, this can take place in competition at events or out of competition at training venues or as well as also even at the athlete's home address. Um, as you should, I guess, as an athlete should be aware that they should always undertake a uh, anti-doping test uh, if presented by a doping control officer, because if an athlete refuses or fails, fails to comply, this could result in up to a four-year ban from competition. So again, it, it's not necessarily a uh, Again, it's not a, an optional uh, thing to be able to uh, take a, an anti-doping test. Uh, essentially, again, once, uh, I guess, a 
PCO has presented themselves uh, to the athlete, then uh, it's really important that you, you I guess, comply uh, with uh, the requirements of the doping control process, as well as also, I think it's important based upon the seminar today to understand the doping control process and your rights and responsibilities as an athlete. Great, thank you for that one. Now, the next one is from uh, Tamila, and the question there is, what about the out of competition period? Which excuses, or I guess, which requests may be accepted uh, as a delay to testing? So I guess maybe the examples that we did use on the slides earlier, mostly related to, you know, the, the in competition testing period, we were talking about, yeah, for example, a medal ceremony and things like that. But um. What, what could be some things for out of competition? Could it be things like, you know, waiting for the athlete representative? What if the athlete is, is doing a media interview as well? You know, that can also happen out of competition. Any thoughts yeah. on this one? Yeah, of course. So again, it is a, it's a really good question in term, and there are slight differences uh, based upon, uh, I guess, the environment that you'll be in, in terms of uh, being able to request a delay to dope and control. Um, I guess, as part of your rights and responsibilities as an athlete. Uh, so as an example, and as you, as you just mentioned, in terms of firstly, uh, an athlete has a right to be able to locate a representative or an interpreter, if available, uh, to assist and uh, help them in terms of the control process. Um, if, for an example, a, a anti-doping organization turned up at a training venue uh, to test an athlete, um, the athlete may request a delay to complete their training session um, and that would be a valid reason to complete that session and then once that session uh, has been completed then you would duly go to the control station. Furthermore uh, and I guess similarly to I guess in competition testing medical treatments uh, obtaining uh, identification um, so that you can do the notification, the notification process these would all be valid um, reasonings for delaying um, the report to open control immediately. Um, and then there is a caveat, uh, I guess, within um, all, uh, I guess, the open control process that any exceptional circumstances which are justified by the athlete and which is dis at the discretion of the DCO to determine may also be a valid uh, reason to delay uh, to report to open Perfect, thank you. Uh, let's try and get through two more quickly. Uh, the first one here is, is sort of like a two-parter. Uh, the first bottle is the A, uh, is that correct? I'm wondering whether maybe this refers uh, to the videos when we were going through the doping control process. And once the sample is provided, which bottles get filled up first and the order there? So generally speaking, I guess when uh, at Doping control officer is uh, filling up the A bottle and the B bottle. They will start with the B bottle and fill up 30 milliliters of urine and then pour the remainder or up to 60 milliliters into the A bottle after that. And this is mainly due to, and then maybe once those levels have been, I guess, filled up, then they, if there is any residual urine left over, then the DCO will probably split that urine between the bottles Accordingly. And this is mainly due to, I guess, the laboratory requirements in terms of um, analyzing the samples and making sure that there's sufficient urine available to firstly, one, analyze the A bottle, but then say if there is a prohibited substance detected, to then have sufficient urine available in the B bottle to perform that confirmation. Perfect, thank you. And then very quickly, as we're almost out of time, so maybe we'll just look at the second part of the next question is, and the full question is, do you think, uh, let me just scroll back up, do you think the doping control process could be improved in the future and is dried blood testing a good initiative? So maybe very final thoughts um, on that one. So, yeah, so it's a very good question. Uh, I, I think there's always going to be innovation within the doping process and uh, to, I guess, improve the tools at anti-doping organizations disposal. Um, however, I think the, the key thing in terms of 
um, improving the doping control process in the future is making sure that this is standardized across the world and ensuring uh, all athletes uh, have the same standard of dope, uh, dope control experience across the board. I think that will be the, the really key area for me to I guess, improve in the future, which again, through projects like uh, ITCO, uh, the ITA are trying to lead on that uh, initiative. In terms of dried blood spot and uh, dried spot uh, dried blood spot analysis, um, I guess for everyone who's unaware of this technique, this is a uh, I guess sample collection where essentially we will make a small incision or small puncture site on either an athlete's finger or on their earlobe, where we will again take a very small amount of urine and then have this uh, absorbed onto a, I guess, a, a small piece of card, where, which can then be sent to a laboratory and then analyzed for certain substances. So there are really great um, sort of benefits to this type of initiative in terms of, firstly, it's a lot less invasive, um, I guess, sample collection process than say, a urine sample or collecting a traditional blood sample. Uh, it's relatively e uh, inexpensive, it's easy to collect uh, from the athlete, uh, as well as also taking up less space in terms of storage for, I guess, samples which are stored for long-term storage, as well as also it's less expensive, so therefore anti-doping organizations can use resources more effectively. So uh, yes, I think initiatives like the dried blood spot uh, sample collection is a good initiative for anti-doping organisations. Thanks so much, Richard. I'm sorry we don't have time to, to hear more of your answers or to address more of your questions. You can see in the chat there that we have uh, suggested that you email us if there is a question you particularly want answered that we haven't been able to tackle during this session. So once again, thank you very much for your expertise, Richard. We hope you can all join us again next week as well, same time. 2 p.m. CET on Thursday, 14th of July, where we're going to talk about medication, supplements and TUEs. And a couple of final reminders from me. Once the webinar ends, you will be redirected to a survey. It just takes a couple of minutes. We'd be very grateful if you could complete that for us. So from me, that is a big wrap for today. Thank you to Richard. Thank you to all of you, our audience, for tuning in. We hope you found this session valuable. And see you again on Zoom next week. And I wish you all a great rest of the day.